Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 1, The Worst Birthday. Oh, wow. Wow, Man. wow, wow. We're, like, in, we're in book two. I feel like I need to change the intro line there so I don't say secrets twice in a row. <laughs> I was reading it. I was like, wait a minute. This doesn't um, sound as good. Unlock the secrets <laughs> of the, the, the chamber, chamber of secrets. Of <laughs> There's so many secrets. <laughs> oh, man. But we're in book two. We are in book two. We're in book two. We're, yes. we're, I think it's always kind of hilarious that uh, the chamber of secrets is this mysterious chamber that exists beneath the school as if Harry didn't literally close the last book in a mysterious chamber I know, beneath, like, beneath the just school. Just a different. This isn't the chamber of secrets of legend, but don't let don't don't be alarmed students. We have many secret chambers here at Hogwarts. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, Th- this is one of those where it's like, did each of the founders have like their own secret basement where they would oh, go right? and do their own experiments? We, ha- we do have at least one theory that each of the founders had like their own like a uh, specific room they created in the castle. Yes, right. We do. So okay, the uh, yeah, walk us through it. So yeah, chamber so of secrets. I, the chamber. So the the uh, the chamber of secrets is almost the problem with the theory because it's like. Uh, the idea is that Godric Gryffindor then would have created the headmaster office and like the yeah because of the Gryffindor yeah right so the uh, the yeah the the tell there is that there is the Griffin door knocker uh, on the headmaster's office so maybe it wasn't initially intended as the headmaster's office this was just Godric's uh, office like personal office right and it yes, like went yes. on to become the headmaster's office but like the fact that there is a Griffin door knocker, which is also the inspiration for the name of this show. If you couldn't tell, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I suspect at this point, at they this put point, it together. you yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and then Rowena would have created the room of requirement yes. just because it's like a very like intelligent room. Um, Helga would have created the kitchens and possibly the great hall because they're sort of connected yeah, in that way. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It, it's always fun to imagine uh, or where's this even just canon that like underneath the great hall is like the same layout uh, it is just canon yeah yeah okay okay uh and, and so like quite literally it's just like you're just transmuting like the uh, like all the food from down here to the up there right, just vroom, which just is pretty neat. straight up um plus it's like the great halls where like everyone comes together and that's very hufflepuff absolutely and then, and then yep. it's almost like then there's the chamber of secrets which is like uh the, uh, the one that slytherin would have created the almost issue being that like like the other three cre- would have created rooms for the rest of the school whereas uh, then he's like, yeah, no, I made one. Don't worry. You can't ask me questions about it. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Guys, guys, it's a big secret. It's going to be hilarious. I shall not be telling people. Um, yeah, this. Th- I, I think there's a couple of different thoughts that I think come to my mind uh, just as we as we discuss this. One of them is like, you know, we talked about or you just mentioned Godric's office eventually going on to be like the headmaster's sweet yeah so to speak um like one one of the things that i feel like i i have contemplated a lot like whenever i've imagined like the founder series and what um like the origination point for for hogwarts could have been is like i think i could imagine at some point in time that it wasn't even explicitly like it was a school it was a place where you could like educate one another on how to like like improve our magical abilities right but you have to imagine like this is a such like a like a much more rudimentary version of like what the the wealth of knowledge surrounding all right, the wizard like, time would have been right like the pomp and circus it's like it's more like the tenth Hunger Games and less like the seventy fourth Hunger Games uh, yeah it's a good comparison right, yeah. yeah yeah it's like things things uh, all the kinks <coughs> haven't been quite worked out yet uh, and in the case of the Hunger Games f- ultimately all of it's just for the worst y- yes. um, <laughs> but but um and like a lot of times I, I like to think that Hogwarts at one point in time was a safe haven for the magical community and, yeah and that's even part of the reason that it's like so uh concealed and protected um, is because like at some point in time it was like well it's there's no point in like undoing these enchantments like yeah. we, may, we may as well keep the students safe as long as we're at it but like I think you know the the like persecution of um, people perceived to be magical during that particular era of time was probably rather significant in a way that the wizarding folk would have been highly unable to you know like stand against right and the like part magical community like the castle also has like all these built in def- like like uh, has it like a built in army with like the suits of armor and stuff. And it's like, like that, that was put in the castle 
for a reason. Like they must have had something to defend against. Yes. Yeah. Like precisely. they needed some kind of protection built into the school. It's like there's no, otherwise there's no real reason your high school needs a magical army at its disposal. Right. <laughs> right. Know? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah I think there was there must have been something there. My other the other thing that like helps are the founders each made one of the rooms in the castle. Yeah. That like that makes the chamber of secrets less of a secret is that in like my own personal headcanon, I think we, you and I have talked about this, is that like the other three founders like definitely just knew about the basilisk at one point. Oh, so sure. like okay. Slytherin could have like specifically made this chamber is like this is where I'm going to keep the basilisk. Right. Like it's obviously a threat to people, but you know we all love we all love the basilisk, and we have you know I can't get rid of it. It's a giant legendary creature that's helped us out of so many jams, but obviously it's quite deadly. So I made it its own room in the basement. Right. And then my like the head. This is just personal head cannon is that what you know, eventually there's the crack and Slytherin leaves the school is that the reason no one can find the chamber and that no one can remember what the monster is is because he like hides the secret inside of Slytherin's locket yeah. when he leaves. And so it's, it's kind of like the Fidelius charm. It's like they all knew about it at one point, but now it's like we we know there is a, a basement and we, we know there is a monster, but like what is it? I don't uh, we can't like they like magically can't remember. Yes, because I, of the locket. Right, right, and I could totally see that. I mean, I think it's it's it, it kind of like even stands to reason that like you know I think part of like you know Fantastic Beasts is all about is like like a lot of beasts are just kind of misunderstood, and if like you understand how to work with them in a way that is like positive, and and that's exactly like what Newt has dedicated his life to, then they can they can be massive and and terrific assets, right, um, or otherwise just meant to be respected in some other capacity to exist in in their most natural environments. Um, but yeah, I could totally see a world where, I mean, with, with all the other defenses in place, I mean, the Basilisk could have been, you know, sort of like their ace in the hole. Oh, like, I, like literally in the hole, too. In the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the hole, yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's super cool. And, and again, like kind of going back to this idea that, you know, Hogwarts would have been a safe haven and a protected place for, you know, the wizarding population. It then eventually would have expanded over to the only, uh, like, e- exclusive wizarding town, which is Hogsmeade directly right. next to it. So even yeah. that would sort of make sense because it would be like, okay, all these people went, they all stayed in the castle. There was like education to be had, you know, in, in less of a traditional capacity. So like in my mind, I'm not even thinking of like 11 year olds coming of age and going to school. This is just sort of like, you know, maybe somebody's teaching herbology to any spectrum of people who want to know more about magical plants. And right. And it's stuff. not like a, you age into it. It's just like, if you're a wizard at all, come over to the school and we'll teach you things. Yeah, like we should share knowledge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and, and then at that point in time, I feel like Hogsmeade would almost be like the representation that like at some point in time, they were able to uh, feel comfortable enough to expand to a, an area adjacent to the castle mm-hmm. where they could then live in a much more known capacity. Right. Well. So yeah. Yeah. anyway, kind of a kind of a just a general deep dive on, on the title of the book. <laughs> the title of the book, um, Chamber of Secrets. Which I feel like we can partly do because as we enter chapter one, um, there is there's a, a, a bu- an abundance of things that I think are happening here. And I think it's I think it's a well-crafted chapter, especially if you are the reader consuming this book um, based on like the original release dates. Yes, like um, you can definitely tell reading it in 2023 that when this book was written, it very much had in mind, especially in the first chapter, like, let me catch the reader up on everything they might have forgotten in the past year and a half between release dates or whatever. Yeah, so this is this is kind of like one of those funny things where it's like, um, like stories can, can, like, you could almost imagine them being told differently or maybe even once more time had passed because this is still going to be like, you know, inside of the 90s and, and maybe there's a greater expectation for like the reader's relationship with a specific story and their willingness to have like just be up to date by the time they're picking up the second installment. Well, yeah, and I mean, at the, certainly at this point too, even, but like by the time Chamber had come out, Harry Potter wasn't the phenomenon Harry Potter yet. Yes. Like it yeah. was a popular book or whatever, but it wasn't like just assumed that everyone who bought the book was just like extremely well-versed 
in the entire wizarding world. Precisely, yeah. precisely. Yeah. So I, I think coming into this chapter, basically what, what you get is a lot of kind of like recap of the, of the previous story. You're getting a, um, a bit of a reacquainted with just how awful life is at the Dursleys. But I, I think sort of like the, the signature touch of the particular chapter is the very last sentence um, is basically when Harry goes back up to his bedroom. The trouble was there was already somebody there. Yeah, it's like you almost know. the same sentence from the end of chapter 16. Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep, yeah. Where it's like, it's like, oh man, what a good cliffhanger. Yeah. But I think what this does and, and just trying to get into the mind again of that reader from, you know, the, the late nineties or whatever is basically it's sort of like, okay, like, yeah, oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So we went to a magical school. Okay. Yeah. We're on Hermione or his friends. Oh yeah. The Dursleys, they're the worst. And, and, you know, you're sort of like, but like the, otherwise it's kind of like a light chapter, like not like Harry mows the lawn, you know, like not a lot happens. Yeah, not much happens. Like he basically just sort of sees Dobby in the bushes, but you don't even know who Dobby is yet. Right. But but yeah. then if you get to the end of it and you're like, wait a second, who's who's in his room? Who's in his, who's room? In his room? It's like, well, it's kind of well, interesting. It's like there's not supposed to be anybody in the Dursleys. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, like who are the eyes in the bush? Um, you know, so I feel like if if you're picking it back up and you're getting through this chapter and even if you're like, well, you know, like nothing really like wild is happening, you get to like the last sentence and you're like, all right, I'm back. I got and it. I, okay, I, I got to turn the page. I'm turning the page. I yeah. want to know what's up and and yeah. sure enough, you're introduced to, you know, then like a brand new creature, uh, yeah. which is going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, I feel like that's that's sort of like my my quick synopsis of, yeah. of chapter one. But now we can do the nitty gritty. Now, now we can go. Yeah, we can go do the nitty gritty. So let's just start with uh, the chapter art here for the worst birthday, which features Harry sitting on a bench and you can see Dobby's eyes over in the bush. And uh, what's your what's your take on the art on this one, Ben? I get such like where's Waldo vibes. I do. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is. It is. I, it, this is a we're not starting off on a good note chapter art wise. I'm like, first of all, I was like, is there when does Harry even sit on a bench? And it turns out he does. I went and found it he, you know, he even, in the chapter. He even paints. He the even bench. paints the bench yeah. in this chapter. Yeah. But yeah, there's something about this. Just just screams your It's very like where's Waldo or it looks like a like a Sunday morning comic strip or something. Yeah, like like, like, like bazooka bubblegum. Yeah, there's type. something yeah. a little off putting about it. I don't exactly know what it is, but it's not super magical looking. I didn't love this one. I was like, OK, all right. The whatever. one thing the one thing I'll say is that because, you know, so often I'm I'm now uh, listening to the book, so I don't even get exposed to the chapter art at all. The one thing I will say is that like this, this concept of like Dobby's eyes being visible in the bushes um, is always kind of like one of those things where I'm like, I don't like I, I, I think as a kid, literally what I was imagining was the bush itself magically had eyes or like somehow like Dobby was like mirroring his face onto the bush. Like, like I, I never could quite picture in my head what it meant that he could like look at the bush and see these two, you know, bright yellow eyes. Right, like staring and out. Staring out and, and like how that would look. But like ba- I would say that what the chapter art does do is sort of give me like a, like an, like some imagination as to like how the eyes are almost like glowing in what is otherwise kind of like a shadowy area. So like the, the, the light reflecting off of his eyes is kind of making like the eyes themselves visible where like the rest of Dobby wouldn't be. Right, yeah. Um, I think this is also like a case where like Dobby's eyes like in the movies aren't given the like big bulbous treatment. He just sort of has like regular looking eyes. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's so, true. Like, you know, maybe you don't always think of Dobby as having these like huge eyes the way it's described in the book. But yeah, protuberant protuberant eyes yeah. as it were. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so that's the artwork here. Um, I thought this was it's funny that you mentioned the last sentence because the very first sentence, I think uh, it was just un- maybe un- I don't know if unusual, but uh, in the first sentence of Sorcerer's Stone and in the first sentence of Chamber of Secrets, the uh, Dursley's full address is listed in both. <laughs> number, four, number, number four, four Privet Drive. Drive. Yeah. <laughs> like, here's where we are. Like, what, a, what an interesting, like, I wonder how intentional that was. Like, this is how the book will start and this will immediately put you in the world again. Like, it's it's exactly how the last book started. Yes, yes. Well, you know, this is this is sort of interesting in a total aside, uh, kind of secondary to the, the, the books themselves, but this was something that I was noticing when I was pulling some clips for... Um, an episode of Super Carlin Brothers yesterday is the frequency, or I, this may even be true for all of the Harry Potter films that they end with a shot of Harry, Ron, and Hermione together. 
Um, oh, not prisoner of Azkaban. Not prisoner. Oh, yeah, because Harry yeah, does, does like the freeze the, frame on the firebolt with like the smudge face. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You're right. Well, okay. So what was interesting to me is I was like, man, every time I finish the series, I just want to go back and start at the beginning again. Is is I think what we're saying in the video. So I go to like the last scene, sands the epilogue uh, from Deathly Hallows, and they're they're all three standing there, just like together in a row, you know, like with the the crumbling castle sort of behind them. Yeah. And then if you cut to the ending of Sorcerer's Stone, it's right after Hagrid has given Harry the, the photo album the photo album yeah. and they're like all three getting like on the train together and it's just like oh that's so crazy that like like literally like if you go from the end to the beginning it's like it's like the same shot which i just thought was kind of fun so that is that's anyway a little bit of continuity from from you know our intros and outros i guess neat, neat. um yeah i love this so uh, otherwise on the first page here uh we get uh harry's just at breakfast you find out that hedwig has not been able to fly anywhere i love the line from uncle vernon where he's like do i look stupid and it's just like it's such a funny thing it's like you can and almost like as you're reading it it's like yes you look stupid. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like it's like he's trying to make this point about how non-stupid he looks, and it's like the exact opposite is being achieved D- due to his bit of fried egg bit dangling fried from egg. his bushy mustache. I know. Gosh, what a! I, it seems I can, I, it's like annoying me how distracting it is staring at him in my mind's eye. I'm like, just fix that egg. I know. <laughs> it's Get like that hey, egg off your face. Can, can someone let him know, please? Yes. Please. Let's let's solve, let's let's rectify that problem. Yeah. Also, uh, I think it's funny that Dudley, one of his first lines is, "I want more bacon." Which to me, it's like it's surprising to me almost that he still eats um, uh, pork-based products after having a pig's tail the last year. <laughs> you know? like, like, did you not get the joke at all, man? Like, oh man, oh, you're still eating bacon. You were like half pig for a year. Okay, I, I know. I I have never <clears throat> picked up on that before, but that actually, uh, I feel like that is also very intentional. Yeah, that like we're we're we <laughs> literally like left. Let the last we've seen Dudley, the last exchange we've had with him basically was him having a pig's tail. Yeah. And now the return is his his eating bacon. That his is eating that, bacon. Man, that, that totally is is just way over my head. Um, the next line is, there's more in the frying pan, Sweetums, from Aunt Petunia. Uh, this frying pan gets some serious action. It in, does. In, in this particular chapter. I know. Uh, where, where I'm skipping ahead a little bit now, but at some point in time, Petunia will be cleaning said frying pan and swing it at Harry's head. Yeah. Which is like one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like the the level of actual abuse that Harry is enduring underneath the Dursleys is like terrible. I know. And it's I'm like, so is bad. this like what, what I mean, in my mind, I'm like picturing like maybe it's not like a cast iron frying pan, but like we don't know that it's not, you know? Oh like, my gosh. I mean, I, it, and, and honestly, it doesn't matter. Any frying pan you hit someone with <laughs> right, is right, right. going to hurt. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's like it, it's it's such a violent uh, object. Yes. Um, as we learned so so clearly in the film Tangled. Yes. I mean, I li- which I also literally watched last night. Oh, no way. That's yeah, so, funny. so funny. Okay. And then also just speaking of the frying pan, I highlighted this um, as their uh, as Dudley is sitting at the table with his large bottom, which is drooping over either side of the kitchen chair. He says, pass the frying pan. And I'm like, it ju- I'm like, are they setting the frying pan directly on the table with, <laughs> with the bacon on it? Like, does, am I am I crazy or does, I've never been at anyone's house where they're serving the bacon directly out of the pan on the table? Yeah, no, no, no. The bacon definitely goes into like a, onto like a plate, like onto a plate. Yeah, yeah. With, with like a paper towel. Not at the know, Dursleys. To like absorb some of that grease. Can't be um, bothered with that. Yeah, no. I mean, um, yeah. The the whole scene I really do think is just intended to just show you just just how truly. Uh, awful the the Dursleys are because then yeah. as you scroll down just a little bit more um, basically Harry says you've forgotten the magic word to the the request of frying the to passing the frying pan um, and Vernon ends up just going absolutely off and in all caps says I warned you I will not tolerate mention of your abnormality under this roof and I'm like man that is like that is rude like in every single way all yeah. the time and always yeah it's just like Gosh, you right. guys are so like there. It, there's it, you're so indefensible. I I mean it is like it, especially because it's like it doesn't it doesn't feel like if Harry's abnormality was like of a more Muggle variety that they would be treating him any differently. 
you know, like if he was just like a physically handicapped person oh, sure. or something, yes, you yes. know, I mean, it, it <laughs> like makes they you would feel still like, be bothered by it. Yes, absolutely. It just seems like that's the kind of folk that the Dursley happen to be, yeah. which is which is just unacceptable. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, uh, going into the, the 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 next page, though, there's just a line that just like it's it's basically just like talk like Harry trying to like calm um, Uncle Vernon down who is breathing like a a, <laughs> a winded, winded rhinoceros. rhinoceros. I know I highlighted that too. I was yep. like, what a great description. <laughs> yes, um, but basically it says like Harry Potter wasn't a normal be Harry Potter was not a normal boy. As a matter of fact, he was not as or he was as not normal as it is possible to be. Harry Potter was a wizard yes. and I just highlighted that and just said, yeah, he is. It's just like, I don't know why it's just sort of like, it's like, that's like one of those like punch the air kind of moments. Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he, I also he is a wizard. I know I highlighted that as well because I think it's interesting that it's like, I like the description. He's as not normal as it is possible to be because like we right, like what, what they're saying is that Harry is a wizard, but like it's true that that sentence remains true. If he was sitting at like the Weasley's table, you know, like even within the wizarding world he's pretty much as not normal as it's possible to be that's a good point yeah, yeah. He's, he's kind of the exception to a lot of rules he's very critical to everything right um, like yeah, him, so. him and Voldemort I think Dumbledore says like you guys have traveled into realms of magic no one else has even you know seen before right right yeah, yeah. Like, so it's like we're yeah, it's like we're like, literally like, witnessing I mean going again back to like the, that like the, the founders and, and the creation of Hogwarts and the rudimentary magic they had at the time it's like it's like this is like a full millennium later right and Harry is on the cutting edge of like what the new magic is, which means the founders. This is like one of those things where people are like George Washington didn't know dinosaurs existed. You know, right? It's, it's like it's like you know the founders who are some of the most you know powerfully magical people who have ever existed have no clue the things that Harry and Voldemort are doing. Right. Right. Well, this is like this is an interesting thing because it's like their Voldemort and Dumbledore refer to like the sacrificial love as like some sort of ancient charm sure. or something like it seems like it it is known of but like how could it be no how can Harry be the only one who has survived death and it's a known of thing without someone else having survived you know That's like question I mean I I guess it is possible that someone could have cast sacrificial protection and then it's similar to how like Harry casts it over the defenders of Hogwarts where it's not like th it's not like any of them then survive death, but they are able to like break the charms of the of Voldemort or something. Yeah, like maybe people like know this is a way to protect someone, but no one's act for, ever actually gone as far as to test it against the Vada Kedavra. Yeah, yeah. Or or even if like ancient magic in some capacity refers to magic that has been like somehow like lost to time entirely. Mm -hmm. Like like uh, even as if there was like a like a heyday of magic before its eventual like revival. Um, you know, which which sort of stands the reason if if again, you know, you're you're imagining a world where where Hogwarts uh, or or even just like the wizarding people go to such lengths to hide themselves from the rest of the world. Right. It probably means that they weren't terribly welcomed by the rest of the world, which probably means that the rest of the world knows a reason why to not welcome them, which would probably mean that at some point in time they did have more power. I can see some. Yeah, that, that's my that's my I'm, I'm trying to move like the, the sliders around in the logic puzzle right. of my brain. Like, yeah, like, you know, possibly that's how they got there. Like, like what you're seeing is is um, like the founding of Hogwarts is the re rise of of magic. And the reason that so much effort goes to like maintaining its secrecy is the knowledge of like what happens if the secrecy is exposed is uh, yeah yeah because it's true. happened before right there's also i know hogwarts legacy explores like quote unquote ancient magic right as like something that like you the main character is like capable of seeing in the way that the other students are not right and yeah. how it's like there have been other students in the past who have like discovered certain things similar to what you as the protagonist are doing. Okay. And those like unlock certain secrets around Hogwarts. There's also like, um, like when Dumbledore is in the cave and half blood Prince, it sounds like there's, um, kinds of ancient magic at play as he's feeling around. So there is like a, a like a, I don't know, a, a different kind of magic that seems to exist. Right, right. Well, and, I mean, that's the other one as well, like where when you when you enter into the objects like the um, like the Deathly Hallows, eventually, you know, it's like they, they seem like truly remarkable in creation or the veil at the Department of 
uh, mysteries or the pensive inside of Dumbledore's office. Like, you know, there, there are magical objects that seem to exceed the boundaries of magic that should have been available upon their original right. creation, mm -hmm. which, which does make me wonder if there is this like X factor kind of similar to like the ability to speak to snakes where it's almost like, like a, quasi I don't know if her, I mean hereditary doesn't feel like the right way but like a lottery draw type of situation where like like sometimes it arises and when right. it does it's like that person is going to have unique capabilities but then even beyond that it's whether or not they they manifest them like right what, what they do with them from right there mm -hmm. um, you know is, is the next piece of the the you know the equation so I don't know it's it, yeah it's particularly interesting I, I don't even know how we got so sidetracked I feel like we're talking about I know Harry. I was I was worried coming into this chapter like not a lot happens like what are we gonna <laughs> talk about uh, but no we're doing okay yeah, yeah. Um, I do think it's funny that at the bottom of this page uh, where Harry is like what did the Dursleys care if Harry lost his place on the house Quidditch team because he had practiced all summer yeah I, that I, I, I was like I, yeah I was like um, Harry first of all that's not a concern like you literally made the team without a tryout last year or having ever played the game or even heard of the game last year and yes. since then you've done nothing except catch the snitch in your mouth and end the shortest game in Hogwarts history so like you're fine I dude. think you're doing good. I don't think anybody is like on the fence about whether or not you deserve your spot on the team especially when not being there is when uh, Gryffindor gets like demolished by yeah Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw. Yeah. yes possibly and possibly Cho Chang we don't know when she makes the team that's a good point that's a good but point I guess but that would mean she was a second year so right th this is another one of those things though where I feel like um for and, and it's kind of interesting because as you see if you look at the books as like installments as part of seven you you sort of have like books one two three where it feels like the stakes overall are much more like down to earth they're much more relative to that of like a teenager and so yeah. like you know I, I bring it up a whole bunch in sorcerer stone or philosopher stone the like the threat of being like expelled from school and and how much uh, you're aware of how bad life is with the Dursleys that you're sort of like really resonating. It's like, like I don't, it doesn't even matter if you like Hogwarts. You're just like, at least he's away from the Dursleys. And like, so right. worst case scenario is this world where like everything's over because he just has to go back and live a miserable existence with them. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we see a lot of this and, and this is sort of like, you know, for books one through three, again, the stakes are kind of small and then like four starts to kind of like bridge the gap. Like where where Harry is still for the most part of the book dealing like like with a popularity kind of contest, like, right? Like, you know, uh, like down to earth problems, asking a girl to um, a dance, yeah. you know, like there, there are things that, like any high schooler may have had to endure. And then on the other side of it, like even the other side of, of Goblet of Fire is like, you know, when he enters into the great graveyard and Voldemort is back and he right. has an army of fully grown fully trained wizards at his disposal and like order of the phoenix is like we are at war with the government you right, know? Yeah. Like, it's like it's <laughs> like, like whoa okay these are not typical high school problems anymore but i find it interesting <coughs> and that that was part of like what made this line stand out to me as well was just sort of like it's like the stakes right now are like oh man how much of a bummer would it be to us the readers who are rooting for harry to like lose a spot on the quidditch team like, <sighs> that would be so disappointing it would be yeah, it would be. Also, the other the other ridiculous thing is that if Harry were to lose a spot on the Quidditch team, it would like all of the other students like the were are, are, were already there. Like they already could have tried out to be seeker except for the first years. Who, so who can't play seeker? Right. Yeah. Who, can, who like apparently oh, oh, like never the, make the yeah, like, right, yeah. yeah. So like the only event in which Harry doesn't get his spot on the house team is because right behind him is the next next base best. <laughs> Quidditch player in a century. Yes. Oh, this is the other thing too, is that like well, so no, what what grade is Cormac in? He, oh, Cormac McClough. I think he's a year ahead of them. He's a year ahead yeah. of them. Okay, okay. Th this is like always one of those things too where it's like surely he should have outplayed someone like it's always not kind Oliver of, Wood. Not, I mean, maybe not Oliver Wood. I mean, it just seems like Cormac is just like a natural built athlete. It's like, how was this guy like getting through school without ever being drafted? I know, right? Yeah. Like, why isn't he ever on the team for anything? Yeah. He just kind of shows up eventually. Just shows like, up like and he's like super Ooh. jock who can catch a fly out of the air with his fingers. And like somehow they've like never encountered him before in the Gryffindor common room. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right, right, like, right. Hey, this guy's in your house and he's apparently like huge, like right, broad, like right. just, just a big guy. It's like you seem like he, he seems like he, we, should, we should see him. I know. Yeah. Right. yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> 
Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there is a sentence on the next page. Uh, I don't know if this was the first time it said it was describing Harry's appearance. If in case you forgot what it looks like, it says he wore round glasses and on his forehead was a thin lightning shaped scar. I wasn't sure if that was the first time you get a description of Harry's glasses as being like the iconic circular round glasses. Oh, interesting or not interesting. <coughs> yeah. Once again, it always brings you back to the question or, or the day in which the Dursleys very begrudgingly would have had to have taken Harry to yeah. the optometrist yeah. you know, to to like have his, get his eyes sorted, get his eyes sorted. So it's like <coughs> you almost have to wonder. It's like it's kind of interesting that it becomes such like an iconic element of his appearance because the Dursleys likely are the ones who provided it to him. I know. You yeah, know? it it's is. Like, it was like there's always that. It's right. always right on his face. Right. Yep. Right yep. there. Um, and then it also mentions that, like, yes, Harry is not just unusual um, in that he's a wizard. He's unusual even for a wizard because of the scar on his head. So there's cool. That's cool. There is uh, the, then this next line. It says at the age of one year old, Harry had somehow survived a curse from the greatest sorcerer of all time. This is just like in- interesting, like Avada Kedavra dodging like like it's it's very similar to how pre learning about the Dementors. They just are called the Azkaban guards until you know the word and then it's always Dementors and yes. it's like it's like it's funny to me that knowledge of the Avada Kedavra curse is like like withheld from you for so long. It's just like he tried to perform a deadly curse on you and it's like there's really just the one <laughs> yeah it's like it's like there's not a whole lot of reason to not just say a vada kedavra from the very beginning yeah but either which way um this is another one of those things too though that i remember as a child reading like you know and, and it says um harry had escaped with his lightning scar and somehow nobody understood why voldemort's powers had been destroyed the instant he had failed to kill harry like it's it's really interesting to try to like like just, just as your own thought experiment attempt to go back in time and put yourself back in the headspace where you don't know the answer to this right because it's like it's like now i can read that sentence and it, it largely means i mean it, i wouldn't say that it means nothing to me it's just that like it's hard to imagine not knowing right yeah like what 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 happened yeah exactly but like i do remember like that this mystery drove me nuts as a kid mm-hmm. and it was like you know you go through book after book after book and it's like it's we still not still answered. don't know it's like like you know the fact that the through line is preserved like i i mean it's one of those things like where it, it, it's it's hard to know if, if it, like for me to ever imagine like writing my own story it would be so hard to like hold on to a piece of information for years and years and books and books yeah like without ever like giving like the flourish I know, you know like, like, it'd be so hard the other one is like why why Snape hates Harry or, yes. whatever, or why Dumbledore trusts Snape that's the other big one that's like it's just maintained like all the way through until like the second to last <laughs> chapter of the whole series yes yes yeah. it's like Wow, man. Wow. I really wanted to know that this whole time. Yeah, uh, but it makes it very satisfying when it, you eventually do. Now. It does. It does. <laughs> um, I, I did. I, I did a little cross out here uh, in the, the, very, the very next sentence. It says, so Harry had been brought up by his dead mother, sister and her husband. He had spent 10 years with the Dursleys and I crossed it out and I wrote 9.75. Oh, that's right. I, I love our little nine mm-hmm. and three quarters realization. Right. I, I just think it's super fun. So anyway, so we spent nine and three quarters years exactly. uh, with the Dursleys. Mm-hmm. Yep. No coincidence there. Uh, as speaking of Harry's birthday, though, today, the day in qu- the day of the chapter is Harry's 12th birthday, which, of course, the Dursleys have completely forgotten other than uh, Dudley, who comes to remind Harry that he knows what day it is and mm-hmm. is just loving how much his parents aren't paying attention to him. Yep, 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 absolutely. This is another one of those kind of interesting ones. I may have brought this up once upon a time before, but um, when I met my, my wife Alice for the first time, one of the first things we ever talked about was Harry Potter and yeah. how she was planning. Uh, I was writing a Harry Potter script and she was writing for a video and she was planning a Harry Potter um, party that she was going to be hosting like a month later, um, which was really fun. And she was going dressed as Golden Snitch. And I was like, well, I've got to, got to see how that plays out. Um, but the other interesting thing is that uh, my wife Alice also shares Harry's birthday, which I just ah. was always kind of like, that's so wild. What like, are the odds? It, it felt like one of those things where I'm like <coughs> looking around, I'm like, did somebody send her here? Is I this know, a bit? Right, like, right. <laughs> so like, come how, on. How could this be? <laughs> anyway, so that's I, fantastic. I always thought that was really cool. Good omen. Yes, that is that is a good omen. Um, let's see. Moving down, we have uh, the Dursleys instructing Harry to be at his room, pretending he doesn't exist, which, again, just on his birthday, just oh, <laughs> so terrible. Like, what I want you to do when people come over is go upstairs, don't make a sound. In fact, actively think about how you don't exist. Yeah. You're not really here. 
I, I know. I don't, yeah, Th- this is this is one of those really interesting things, though, because this chapter outlines a, a, a couple of bits of it that I think are uh, very, very relatable and just good life observations, which is that, like, I don't think that Harry expects the Dursleys to be terribly nice to him. So them behaving in a way that is in a consistent manner to how they've always behaved is almost sort of like like, you know, it's just par for the course. Like, I mean, not to again i'm not defending the dursleys i mean it's awful the way that they treat him but i think this is it's something that i feel like i've come to relate to a lot uh which is the fact that what's really bothering harry is that it's his birthday and all summer he hasn't heard from his friends right you know and like so what's really bothering him is that it's like it's like it wouldn't be so bad if the people who didn't like me continued to not like me right what's hard is when you feel like the people who did like you have stopped right um and and i think that that's sort of like i i tend to 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 relate to this phenomenon a lot where it's like you know if, if there was somebody who already didn't agree with me then I'm, I'm not expecting for them to magically agree with me but if there's somebody who who i have like now let down it's like oh right that hurts yeah that hurts yeah it is worse and so that's that's a lot of like what harry is dealing with and of course at this point in time we would have no idea why because the last we've seen uh ron and hermione they both literally put their own lives on the line to help harry and you know his quest for the sorcerer's stone right like they promised the right to him ron says he's going to invite him over yeah but then you know but then for 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 some unknown reason you're just sort of like but they didn't write him any letters at all. Did they just get home and forget? Like, I do, know. do they not care? Or are they, I mean, especially, I mean, like even Ron, I mean, you could almost see a world where he would like, you know, just get home and he'd be so busy with like life at home and he's got all of his siblings. There's like lots of distractions. And yeah. Stuff. But like, it feels like Hermione, um, you know, is, is also going to be a little bit isolated from the world that she's kind of come to know as her own reality. Like, it seems like, like, that would be the one where I'd be like, man, it really seems strange that Hermione has it written. It does, yeah, it would absolutely. Also, as I'm thinking about it, because I think like each of them has written him like actually many letters that Dobby has intercepted. Yes, and it's like immediately making me think like, how much time and effort is Dobby putting into this endeavor that like all summer he has like successfully been on the lookout literally every time an owl came to the house. Like he must be there in all of his spare time. Yeah, well, like I mean, since summer started. But I, I think this is this is like part of the extreme power of of house elves. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I, I think that they are like this is this to me is like it's almost in keeping with what we eventually learn about them. Like, I just think that they are just so overlooked in terms of like what they can do. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's also interesting, especially as we and, and I'll, I'll save some of it for the next chapter, like like the lengths that Dobby has been able to like to go to, despite the fact that it would probably be contrary to the um uh like perspectives intentions whatever of his masters mm-hmm. um which is which is like something that seems like you know house elves are are just magically bound to yeah so like it's also one of those things that will eventually make me love dobby just so very much because right. he's like he is like literally he himself is overcoming his own programming for the good of everyone. Right. You know, which and he shows it in weird ways. <laughs> he does show it in weird ways. The other thing that they, like, I guess um, for Dobby's plan, like uh, it, 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 what a weird thing I'm just sort of thinking about now is that like Draco and Lucius or Lucius must be, I don't know who he's talking about this to, um, but obviously that's who Dobby's getting the information from. The terrible things are going to be happening at Hogwarts and that's why Harry shouldn't go like Lucius must be having these conversations with somebody like the moment summer starts, like the moment Draco gets home, because like at least at least has the conversation before Ron is able to send any communication to Harry because those letters should have gotten to Harry. But like right away, Draco must like walk through the door like Harry Potter. Mark, dad, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> He's not cool, man. He's not cool. I don't like that kid. He ruined the house competition for him. What can we do about it? And he's like, no worries. I'll buy you and six of your friends in Nimbus 2001 and I'll unleash a terrible monster. It'll be okay, Draco. <laughs> well, we, yeah. can, we, can, we can solve this. Yeah. But that's the thing is that Draco himself, like, <laughs> like Lucius must be doing it uh, in reserves enough that, that Draco doesn't know. Right. So yeah, who is Lucius speaking out loud to about this plan like just Narcissa because like Draco doesn't know about it yeah it, I mean that's a good question because it's it's hard to know like um, it's hard to know <sighs> let's see because 
I mean, especially because we eventually know that like Lucius's real plan is, I think, to try to plant it with a Weasley in order to incriminate them while also disposing of an incriminating possession of his own. I, yeah, I guess that is part of it. Yeah, because like raids are happening and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I don't know. That's that, that. That yeah. That feels like a very multi-faceted question like it would be so interesting to just be a fly on the wall for that conversation well, like, he knows like, that giving the diary away will open the chamber of secrets or that like, could yeah yeah because yeah. he know he knows enough that that should happen he doesn't know it's a horcrux so that like Voldemort's soul is literally in there right because that's the thing that like where <coughs> Dumbledore is like I have a feeling if Lucius Malfoy actually knew what he possessed he never would have been so careless with it right which yeah. is another one of those things where it's like if Voldemort could have like legitimately felt like he trusted someone or like had enough in him to trust somebody to tell them the truth, then like he would have been way better off. But of course he can't, which is to his own demise. <laughs> As per always. As per yeah. always. It's always Voldemort's really his own undoing. Yes. Um. Anyway, moving on. This is maybe the cringiest line in the whole book, and I hate it so much. And it is, and I think it's supposed to be cringy, but it is what Dudley is going to say to the Masons when he gets there. He says, we had to write an essay about our hero at school, Mr. Mason, and I wrote about you. And I'm just like, I hate this line so much because it's like, like, there's no scenario. Like, as far as Mr. Mason is concerned, this kid has never even met him before. I like, know. why there's like, it's not even, it's not believable as the adult to the child that like it's so it's so clearly set up and like the dirt like like they should be like Dudley that's adorable don't say that because he'll know that's not true because you've never met and he's not like a heroic person he's just a guy with a job you know like and it's also just like we had to write an essay for school like it's summer dude like like, nothing oh I just hate it I hate that sentence so much and it's like I think you're supposed to I think it's just supposed to be cringy yes but no I totally agree with you I highlighted it as well and just put oh I know, like no, yeah. no. Um, moving on, they're of course uh, they'll be sh- they're hoping that this deal goes through so they could shop for their vacation home in Majorca, their just favorite place in the world. <laughs> that, I do love that. This is one of those things I never really noticed is how much the Dursleys just love Majorca. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it's like it'd be interesting to know. And I mean, this is this is like a question for like British listeners. It's just simply like, um, like what. Look, I, I wonder what, like, is Majorca, like, and I, I do not mean to throw any amount of shade whatsoever or at, at anyone for any reason, but mm-hmm. um, is it, like, would it be, like, retiring to, like, Florida, like, oh, which is, right, like, a yeah. rather common right. thing, you know, for Americans right. to do? Like or, or is this when, like, super rich people in New York, like, somewhere in the Hamptons? Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, that's a good point because it doesn't feel <laughs> like I mean, as as much as the Dursleys subscribe to, you know, this sort of like suburban cookie cutter lifestyle and and, and they do seem to do reasonably well for themselves. They, they still seem firmly like in what I would interpret as like middle class. Right. You know, yeah. like, I mean, they like, just live in the suburbs. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So I like the Hamptons would seem like it, and again, this is just my own interpretation, but it's like that does seem like like like. One percent are kind of wealth, right? Yeah, it, it does feel like that. So I don't know what kind of uh, what kind of drill order Mister Mason's about to drop on them. I do like the but. fact that his last name is Mason, though, because a Mason is somebody who builds with like, yeah. stone and blocks. So right. It's like, so. Ah, it's on the nose. I get it. I there get it, it is. Yeah. Um, but so then from there we um, we do start to see a little bit more of like you know the the rivalry, I guess if you if you want to call it that between Dudley. Uh, and Harry occurring in this chapter, which is basically when you know Harry is outside on the garden bench. He's staring absentmindedly into the hedge, and the head was staring back. The hedge was staring back rather um, with a, those two enormous green eyes. I think I said yellow earlier. The green <coughs> eyes. Um, and Dudley comes out and is is like sort of taunting Harry in a way that feels like like I'm uh, like I almost feel like sophisticated for what I expect from Dudley. Like, like he's like, I know what day it is. Like, I know that you're being slighted today. Like, like it's, it, it feels much more like Dudley to have just forgotten entirely. Right. Yeah. You know? But like, he's like, it, there is a bit of like active, like joy in the way in which Harry is not getting special treatment on this day. Do you suppose on any level that this is maybe, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a huge limb here. Okay. This is actually giving Dudley like, like the tiny, and I, I can't even call it foreshadowing because no part of me thinks it's intentional in this way, but like 
the fact that Dudley actually knows Harry's birthday, is this in any way, shape, or form a small indicator to the fact that like a lot of what Dudley has been taught his whole life is to like kind of ape the uh, opinions and in, in thoughts of his parents, but like in the meantime, like also knows things about Harry, like where maybe like like Vernon and Petunia are literally forgetting about Harry's birthday. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Do, that is a good question. Like, do you think they have like are like ignoring it on purpose or did they just actively forget? Yeah, that's the question, because if Dudley <clears throat> remembers it, it at the very least. And again, I'm giving I mean, I'm trying to give like uh, I'm trying to trying to pull a mile out of an inch here. Yeah, it means he knows Harry's birthday. That's true. Which which is like, you know, which is oh, maybe more than you can say for his parents. <laughs> yes, correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that that's always one of those things where, where I can't ever give Vernon and Petunia a pass, but there's a part of me that is also like Dudley is still the product of something he had no control over, which is the, the thoughts and opinions of his parents. Right. And it's like for better or for worse. And I would say the same thing about Draco. That's hard to overcome. Yeah. You know, yeah. so and, and that's the type of thing where <clears throat> I think a lot of times uh, you, once you see people go out into the world and and maybe they have like their own individual experiences, things change. And it seems like for Dudley, by the time you know, like like Harry is is they're parting ways forever and ever. Like Dudley's kind of like, I don't think you're a waste of space. Which which again, you know, it's like you're trying to give, trying to make a mile out of an inch. Yeah. You know, for for some kindness from Dudley here, because it's not exactly the the nicest way to phrase it. Um, but it, it it feels like there's like a beacon of positivity that is finding its way out of this boy. Right. <laughs> um. And so anyway, I'm I'm maybe maybe. We can we can grant him just a little bit of credit there. A, a grain, even yeah. though he came, or even even if it's like, yeah, he knows his birthday, so he like does care a little, even though he's using that knowledge just to bully Harry, to, to hurt him. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do love the uh, fake magic words that Harry retorts back with jiggery pokery hocus pocus wiggly wiggly, <laughs> which is like it's such a funny like like oh those are sort of magic words that you as a person who hadn't read Harry Potter yet might associate with magic. Well, th this is also a really interesting one because like Hocus Pocus would probably be uh, like, you know, in the exact same column of well-known magical words as abracadabra. Yeah, I'm most surprised abracadabra wasn't in there. Yes, because abracadabra, if you don't know, is supposed to be like the way that muggles have misheard Avada Kedavra. Yes. Yeah, Yep. exactly. Yeah. So uh, and maybe maybe that's intentional in that capacity where right. it's like that one's been like tucked into like the back pocket. It's like, right. hold you'll, on, hold you'll on. You'll see it eventually. Yeah, no, well, yeah. you'll get there. It'll yeah. get there. But you're right. Hocus Pocus is in there. So I wonder, is there, I wonder if there's a magical spell in Harry Potter that sounds like Hocus Pocus. Nothing is coming to mind immediately. But yeah, no, nothing specific. Nope. All um, right. So I, yeah, I don't know enough <coughs> of the 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 underlying etymology of any of the rest of those. If if jiggery yep. pokery or squiggly wiggly have have additional meanings, right? Um, but I, I suppose it's possible if if at least hocus pocus was selected, these other two could be something. Squiggly wiggly just sounds like gibberish. To D me. Yeah, it all just sort of sounds like gibberish. Um, anyway, for doing this, this is where uh, Aunt Petunia aims a heavy blow, which I also <laughs> underlined was like, geez. Yeah, I know. <laughs> with yeah, a soapy yeah. fry. <laughs> Come on. Man. Like, not just like I swung it at him, like, don't you do that again. It's like, I took a, I reared back yes, and tried yes. to inflict damage. The other thing that's, <clears throat> that's going through my mind, and I know this shouldn't be my priority, is I'm like, you're about to send, like, soap and bacon grease all over your apparently pristine kitchen. Yeah. You know? It's just like, it. it's like, yeah, I mean, like, like I mean, yeah, it's not worth it in any capacity. Yeah. But you know, also that this is just like the difference between reading this as a child and I think reading this as a thirty-five year old. But uh, there's the next paragraph is like the ways in which Harry has to pay for it, and it says Harry cleaned the windows, washed the car, mowed the lawn, trimmed the flower beds, pruned the pruned the roses, and repainted the garden bench. And I just like wrote a note and I was like, is it is it bad that this sounds like a very pleasant day to me? <laughs> <laughs> I know what a day. I know like, so I, productive. This is not terribly dissimilar to literally how I spend my Saturdays at this point in time. Um, so and I, I also um, I, I just put in there next to that and I just said this is an impressive amount of work though. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I mean good on Harry. I well mean, it again. also takes him to 7 30 p.m. which I just wrote down as sort of like a, what kind of dinner part you're waiting the Masons wait to eat dinner until 7 30 like Come on, it seems like a late party. Right. Know. Yep. Yep. No, it does. It does indeed. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I, and this is like, I, I don't know at this stage, like maybe this was a lot more common for, for like 
uh, sales meetings back in the day would be like to go to each other's homes. Yeah. But like in the professional environment of the modern day, this feels like it would cross lines of some kind or something like I, I, and maybe it doesn't like that it, is interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Like it wouldn't seem strange to me to like for like colleagues or, or like maybe it's like like, you know, host like a, like, you know, like your manager or something like that, like possibly, you know, at your home. Um, but like I, I, I don't know if it feels more or less unlikely given that these are people who he is like attempting to like close a sale with or something like there's there's way too much obvious underlying intention for me to ever attend one of these things where it's like this is someone who just wants something from well, me. Well, so, yeah, I don't like, have any. I think Mr. Mason, I, I mean, uh, isn't arriving like, well, this Vernon guy who typically buys dr- uh, sells drills probably just wants to be buds. Yeah, invi- you know, like, inviting <coughs> me to his home. Right, like I think he he knows what's coming and is uh, familiar with it. And it's I do think once upon a time a lot of business was built more on like what kind of personal relationship do we have? Yeah, like yeah. I always remember like even when I used to like work at a concert venue, there was like <coughs> the the older the salesperson you were talking to was the more likely it was that they were that you would like they would want to go like have dinner after work or get like drinks or something as opposed to just have like a quick meeting in the conference room sure you know? sure yeah or or additionally like um like I, I even feel like this happens sometimes the difference between someone who like like emails and phone calls yeah it's like like a phone call to me it's almost like oh you want to get personal <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's like we're, we're gonna speak on the phone with one another uh, oh, oh wow. wow okay yeah, okay all, all right. right all right this must, must, must be a big deal <coughs> yeah. um so anyway uh yeah then we're then we're basically we're we're getting ready to close out the chapter harry gets his just absolutely like after having such a, a laborious day of work he has given his dinner of what is it like a slice of bread and a lump of cheese yeah. two slices of bread and a lump of cheese mm-hmm. on a kitchen table um meanwhile there there what sounds to be a, a really spectacular feast that has been created otherwise like this this almost feels like the type of thing where like again you know it's like petunia must be like like I, I, it's funny because like I feel like a lot of times Petunia is slammed for being extremely clean and neat. Yeah. But like otherwise seems like, you know, like a rather capable cook. Yeah, she must be. I mean, both of like her son and her husband are both fairly like portly. Yeah. So like yeah. What, what 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 steps is she needing to go out of her way in order to create like negative grade meals for I know Harry, right you yeah. know like like even like having made him like a grilled cheese you know when otherwise you've got this gleaming roast pork <laughs> right, sizzling like all, in the oven all it would have taken was to like heat the ingredients you already gave him yes yeah. and it would have been slightly better but right. instead it was just sort of like an irregular like it even seems unlike petunia to cut an irregular lump of cheese right like she yeah. would almost have to be like breaking her own bearings <laughs> right to be like well i'm just gonna rip a piece off and give it to him instead of like slicing it neatly which <laughs> means that, like yeah there's 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 never there's not just one irregular shape chip piece of cheese now like right, yeah. the whatever's left is also irregular because of the way in which you've given it to him <laughs> right, right, which feels like, very non-petunia but she's like no 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 i can't give this man a a nice even slice of cheese he right, doesn't right. even deserve that a lump of cheese and i'll throw the other lump away and then neatly slice whatever's left yeah yeah mm-hmm. that seems more like that it. does seem like yeah, yeah a little bit yeah. more there so maybe maybe the Dursleys are just forgetting his birthday on purpose is that maybe maybe i'm coming back to that i mean know? the fact that she uh, it's yeah i mean absolutely they are because like she makes a giant design Dessert, a huge amount of whipped cream and sugared violets, which I, I'm like, actually, maybe I should have looked this up, but sugared violets is like, I've always assumed that meant like berries or something, but like, is that like, a, this is clearly like a British thing where I'm like, is that, are you, did you sugar like flower petals? <laughs> I don't know. This is like one of those where like part of my mind almost went to like, like, um, like like an iced rose that you might have on like a sheet cake. And now now I'm just now I'm just curious what a sugared violet might actually be. So I'm looking it up. Hang on one second. All right, sugar. you look up that. Otherwise, we have a loin of roast pork sizzling in the oven, which is also just like that must be huge. Like you could clearly slice off like like a piece for Harry. Okay, for so sakes. oh, I think that they are in fact violet petals that have been candied hey which you can apparently purchase on amazon for seven dollars and 85 cents or uh fair isle.com has a, a recipe on how to make candied violets oh man yeah so that's pretty interesting so violets <laughs> are just an edible um petal okay i suppose yeah all right well very cool yep 
Um, <coughs> otherwise, yeah, uh, we're we're closing out the chapter. This is um, no, this is this isn't even the thing. So I was thinking about the permission slip um, and and like the negotiations. Like you know, if you're quiet all night, like maybe I'll sign your permission slip. But that's not even on the table. No, yeah, that's on, like on uh, that's next. That's, that's, that's next book. That's, that's if you book. behave for Aunt Marge. Right, right, right. right. But yeah, yeah. so it, it is. It is very interesting. So then we're as Harry goes up to his room. Basically, the Masons are about to come over. You can you can feel the stakes at the very least for Uncle Vernon, which I think sets the table rather nicely for just the absolutely disruptive nature that. Dobby is about to uh, uh, provide give, to yeah. the house. I mean, how big of a drill? Like, how big of a drill order does this have to be for them to comfortably think that on the next day they can be shopping for like a beach house? Right. You know, like, what is the commission on the drills? I know. Like, I, I've always assumed like he's selling like Dewalt like power tool drills, but like when you think about it like this, it's like, are you selling like, like? Like, uh, like bulldozer size drills, you know, like construction vehicle size drills. It like could be augers. the case. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Like that, that could absolutely be the case. I have seen, I think in the illustrated edition, like they, they refer to uh, uh, Grunnings as a boring company. Yeah. Uh, like because oh. like, it's boring. Yeah. Like and but like you bore. But you like, like what bore it into something. stuff. Maybe it is like huge drills then. It could be. But then if he's a home builder, then you don't need huge drills. Like you would almost need more like your your everyday like carryable drills. Well, but maybe you're like drilling like straight into the ground to like lay the foundation or something. That is know? possible. That is yeah. possible. But yeah, I think I think you would need to be in my mind. I'm I'm trying to do like what feels like a reasonable <coughs> commission that the Dursleys could be walking away with that they'd be able to go and buy a vacation home. And so in my mind, I'm like, this must be at least a five million dollar sale such that a 10% commission could be a half a million dollars that could then be used to purchase a vacation home with that's the that's that's me backpedaling in my mind right like which would mean that, like this would be a pretty eventful dinner this is a pretty big deal I mean that's a, yeah it does make it seem like it's a very important like roast pork and uh, pudding that I, is being prepared. Can I just say though that I do find it to be slightly interesting that they find such a need to hide Harry because it it seems like you know even even if they like it almost feels more like it more likely that they would like be attempting to make Harry presentable on this particular occasion because it's not exactly like uncommon for people to like show appreciation towards a family who has taken someone in need under their own. Right. Like roof. Like, right. I think that that would show like depth of character and like empathy and caring mm -hmm. and like lots of positive traits. So like, it's interesting to me that, it, that they think like the Masons don't know anything about you, nor will they. Right. And it's like, it's like, all right, whatever. Okay. There's also, all, yeah, it also seems like maybe they just could have sent him to like Mrs. Figs or something for the night. Like why risk? If you're so concerned that Harry is going to unleash even the slightest bit of magic, like why even risk having him in the house? If what's on the table is a beach house, <laughs> right? You right, know, right, like right, yeah. get him out of there, man. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. You're playing yeah. with fire. Seriously. So anyway, I guess uh, next chapter we'll get to we'll get the the full breakdown of all the the calamity that does ensue. Indeed, um, indeed. With with, with chapter Lord. two. Yes, chapter two. Dobby's warning. Oh, the little Dobsters. Little Dobsters. There, I gotta tell you, the chapter art for chapter two, though, I, I won't talk about it now, but I'm not impressed. Oh man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I said it. Uh, shots mm -hmm. have been fired. Okay. Bam. There we go. So so <clears throat> book, book closed for the day. Um, I honestly, I'm not going to lie to you, Jay. I, I too was in a very similar camp and maybe it fueled our tangents in some capacity. But coming into this chapter, I was like, this is such a big recap chapter. Uh, and there, there's there's a lot of like kind of reverse highlighting, you know, the previous story, the world that we live in, who the characters are, how they behave, you mm -hmm. know, the underlying circumstances. So I'm impressed that we were able to. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that as, go on as long as we did. As am I. I will also say that um, I am impressed with our listeners who I was just checking the uh, the YouTube channel before we got here. Of course, we have our, our, our goal of getting our silver play button for the Through the Griffin Door a podcast, uh, yes. podcast YouTube channel. And we are presently at 22,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. We're just like no blowing my mind. No way. Yes, That's so, amazing. Uh, just great milestone. We, we, we blew past 20,000. So we're aiming for, you know, 100 eventually, but just 25 right now. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you know, please do. Thank you so much for watching. 
Uh, it does absolutely mean a lot. I also, uh, you know, I always like to check the charts to see if we're doing anything. Yeah, naturally. Really thing, but, <laughs> you know, I'll say that presently we're doing well on the entertainment news uh, section of various um, podcast things. We're presently number five in the USA. No way. On entertainment news. Okay. So that's right, fun. Right. And then I thought this was just sort of like, wow, that's surprising. But we are presently number one, Ben, in Russia <laughs> of all places. Really? Yes. So uh, I was like, that's okay. All right. So if you're, I mean, thank you to all of our Russian listeners. <laughs> yeah, yes. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. That's, that's really cool. That is really cool. So uh, yeah, as ever, you know, be sure to let us know like where, where are you, where are you tuning in from? And, and definitely if you're willing to go and, and leave us a review, we would certainly appreciate it. It helps with our discoverability as, as the show continues to grow a little bit over here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, speaking of which, I do have a review we can read yeah, later right on here. Uh, this, I don't know why it like um, Apple feels the need to like mask people's names so I can't I can't tell you who left it because it's just listed as I C F Z G D G D U H E D. Hey, well, shout, out, shout out to shout them. out to X of <laughs> uh, <laughs> They said, great podcast. I love listening to you guys go into depth on these books and pointing out things I've never noticed before. Question, what do you think uh, what house do you think Barty Crouch Jr. was in? I know most of the Death Eaters were in Slytherin, but we know that a few others have been in other houses like Quirrell or Pettigrew, so it's possible. My bet is either Ravenclaw because he's incredibly smart and talented or Hufflepuff because he's extremely loyal to Voldemort. Also, the public seemed to doubt that he was a Death Eater even after he was arrested, so maybe that might have been something to do with him not being in Slytherin. So it's a little bit further ahead. This is from book four. Yeah, it is indeed, <laughs> but no, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question just off the nose that I'm, I'm I'm almost surprised we haven't uh, contemplated more before. So, I know you so just sort of assume Slytherin. You you do sort of assume Slytherin, but I I do I like the arguments. I mean the as as the question was unfolding, Ravenclaw is what popped into my head. Yeah, because it does seem like Barty Crouch Jr. is like a highly <gasps> and uniquely capable. Um, person wizard mm -hmm. like not only rather gifted magically um like because I, I is it the case and and correct me if i'm wrong that barty crouch jr at least while barty crouch is under i think he's talking to like a tree or something like that but says that like barty crouch jr received 12 owls yeah i think oh yeah something like that so this this would basically put him in standing with like Percy Weasley right um, as far as we know as like the only other like person capable of it and because as like Hermione is the brightest witch of her of her time and she doesn't even receive 12, 12 OWLs right. because she gives up the time turner after book three does that mean Barty Crouch would have had a time, time turner, turner? Yeah, almost, almost certainly. Almost has yeah almost certainly um, um, I, I love the idea it is very fun to think about but I I think he's still in Slytherin. <laughs> yeah, like just so because, much. like, be, because, like, when he's talking to Harry afterwards, he, I think he says the sentence, like, it required every ounce of my cunning to like guide you through the the Triwizard Tournament. That's a good where point. Where it's like, like, he is constantly having to like problem solve on the fly, keep a thousand lies straight, like give off a certain vibe as mad eye moody but then like never lose harry's trust stay like uh keep dumbledore fooled all while trying to like bring voldemort back and deal with harry who from his point of view is just fumbling in every direction trying to get through it so i think just the absolute level of cunning he displays while disguised as moody to me paints him still like the most as like as a Slytherin. Yeah, I mean, I, and that's a that's a very fair argument. Um, one of the things that I think he's also just not given nearly enough credit for, and you kind of touched on a little bit, is just his sheer ability to act and stay yeah. in role, stay in character. Like it's like I, I've always wondered whether or not like Polyjuice Potion doesn't like come with a small amount of um, like like awareness about like who the person is or like some of their like more recent like thoughts or memories oh, or right like, yeah like, something can, like, like that yeah. can, can kind of like slightly help guide you know and, and i don't i don't even know if it's like a feature or more of like a byproduct of the spell mm -hmm. um it would be interesting to like analyze all the other instances like you know when harry and ron are under in this very book are are, are under the polyjuice as crab and goyle like are they like a little bit more thick yeah. you know are they a little bit more like dim-witted or slow or, right. or you know like like struggling to to think as quickly as either ron or harry would under certain circumstances right and that would be then like a reflection of you know then crab and goyle sort of like integrating you know through the potion right um or like did it help during the battle of the seven potters that like 
everybody under Polly Juice was like maybe that much better of a flyer. Oh yeah, night, right. you know, it like, feels like they would say it. You know, it, like it, it would be in the book, like that, that that would be like brought up. But I guess maybe not. I know, but I mean that's that's the part because like you know you, when you compare it to Quirrell with like Voldemort actually living on the back of his head for all of Book One, like the fact that you know like Quirrell and Dumbledore aren't terribly close, but. Mad Eye and Dumbledore are quite close, and it doesn't seem like Dumbledore knows yeah. that Barty Crouch Jr. is underneath the veil. Yeah, like, that's not part of Dumbledore's big plan. Like that is foiling him. It actively. absolutely is at every step of the way, and like that is always like that to me is like it's such a bummer that Barty Crouch Jr. just gets like utterly defeated and like gets his soul sucked out at, at the end of Goblet. I know because it's like man, like because you don't even get to know it was him. Like the whole, you know, you barely knew him as a character. You always thought he was moody. And like the moment you find out, he's just gone. I know. And it's like you could like, like to the point where like the first time I read it, like I couldn't have even told you Barty Couch Jr. again. I just could have told you that like moody wasn't moody. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, like, like you just, just like, give like, yeah. Um, who is this straw haired kid? Yeah. Who's the straw haired kid? This So interesting question, though, then is if even if you. Um, if if Barty Crouch Jr. was in Slytherin, where was Barty Crouch Senior? Like, was he? Because they're they're a pure blood family, I believe. They, right? They, I I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and it I mean it seems like Barty Crouch Senior was basically on a fast track to be Minister for Magic. Yeah. Um, both of them were probably taught by Slughorn. You know, who like then you feel like mm. would have been like absolutely like you know pulling ties, pulling connections. Absolutely and stuff. seems like Slughorn. But yeah, like Barty Crouch Senior must have been in the Slug Club because he can speak to. like a hundred languages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, like he's a very yeah, 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 yeah. He must have been. It must have been obvious how powerful he was. That's another one. You don't get to see him be powerful. You just sort of like are told he is very powerful. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is which is really interesting. And it's it's like it, it kind of seems like I mean the key thing that then like detours him from ever becoming minister for magic was is the incident with with his, his son with his son yeah, yeah and and everything that kind of sus- subsequently follows. But like even that is one of those things where it's like if that doesn't happen, then the wizarding world. It, I mean, it's we don't know enough to really know, but it seems like would probably be in much better hands than like with fudge. It, d- it definitely seems that way. And like ah, I kind of I feel like it, it would have been great to know that Barty Crouch Sr. was in Slytherin as well, because then that's just like one more like maybe more like good Slytherin character. Not that he was great. Like he definitely does some like negative things like with the sacking of Winky and stuff like that. And yeah, he's yeah. like, you know, even sending his own son to Azkaban. As it's, I mean, I mean, it obviously does the right thing because his son is very dangerous. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. um, but like, he's a, he's a severe person, but he's like he is an effective person, and he does seem to be he is on the good side of things. It, g- it gives you at least a better spectrum for for people from House Slytherin, where yeah. where otherwise, you know, it seems like they're they're like they're they're so. They don't have a lot of depth, you know, like it kind of right. seems like for the most part. I mean, you've got Snape who, who like, you know, in some manner of speak, right. can redeem like, the house. But yeah, I mean, that's the problem. It's like Snape. It's like there's always the talk about like, yeah, he was sort of a hero at the end. But then like also you didn't have to be so mean in the meantime. Like you're you're like you were still like there's still reasons to dislike Snape, even when you know his ultimate like secret. Right. And then like even Draco, it's like he kind of helps, but he doesn't get that like full redemption arc. He doesn't like full on help Harry at the end yeah. or like, you know, denounce Voldemort and like Slughorn. Slughorn's probably the best example of just like a generally jovial Slytherin guy. And look at look how he plays favorites. And he's sort of like a, a fun character. But like, yeah, there's, you know, uh, it's, it's all right. Kind of, kind of comes with its own fault. Yeah. Like, you know, it's yeah. Like very, very like creature comfort fo- focused. I mean, yeah. seems a little like like full of himself in some capacity. So it's like it's like if that's our if that's our those, best those version, are our three best bets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but this again, I mean, just to bring it full circle to the original, you know, kind of conversation we talked about with the founders as well, is that like when you go back to this idea of Salazar and uh, Godric being like the best of friends, mm-hmm. you know, like it's always interesting because I do I do sort of like have this like very jock like image for what Gryffindor would be like, like a very um, like uh like ready fire aim kind of individual just sort of like like a little bit like haphazard and and and, um but like in in a way that i feel like always kind of comes back to sort of like an upbeat and excited and and noble 
way. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's like it's not the worst version of, of what I just described. It's like the best version of what I just described. But for then for him and Salazar to have been a best friends, it's like they had to have been able to either be like puzzle pieces for one another, like where they're like kind of completing each other's faults. And like right. Maybe, maybe Salazar's like a bit more careful and that keeps Godric like out of danger. But like it makes me feel like Salazar must appreciate these kinds of behaviors out of Godric, which is something that feels so not in keeping with everything that you've ever been painted about this character about Salazar other, about yeah. Salazar otherwise. Yeah. So it's like you have to imagine that like Salazar must like fun on some level if he likes Godric because what well, and I mean I'm I'm certainly like projecting my, I know, my yeah. own my own images onto it. But like, you know, the thing that I would love to see in a founder series is is so much like enjoyment and jovial nature and and like kind of like lighthearted goofing. Uh, yes, and, and stuff I think like so. That. Like because like, if you have a founder series, the whole thing like the finale is the crack. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is exactly. Like the like splitting. That's... So, but like if you have like five seasons, then you need 4.9, you know, uh, seasons of them being the best of friends. Yes. Because it all has to be leading to how terrible the crack is and like well, how devastating that is. Because that's that, that leaving is still what you're seeing play out between Voldemort and Harry. Yeah. You it's... know, it's exactly like Rogue One, you know, like in, in the world of Star Wars. It was like yeah. from the moment we saw the first trailer, we're like, well, prediction number one, everybody's going to die. Right. Sort of like, like you just sort of knew that that had to be what happened. And, right. And, you know, it is what happened, but it's not like it doesn't make the movie not good in the process either because because like you're, you're just seeing like important events play out. And but like, you know, then you need to make the ride enjoyable because we know the destination. We know right. the destination is that they they end up being split for some reason for some reason yeah. um and and i feel like you know it, in its best case scenario it's devastating because it's like because what you're what you're witnessing is the loss of something that was otherwise so great it was so great that yeah. that's what has to be that is yes it has to be it has to be so great um and that yeah i think that has to be like the core like the core of that story has to be how good of friends not not just the like all four of them especially but like uh, well i think it has to be like a show about friendship, specifically amongst all four of them, but then even more so Godric and Salazar. Yes, yeah, yeah, and and I think what you would end up seeing is is like episode, like in my mind again, you know, as if somebody's asked me, but like you know, it's like you'd have episodes where it's like you know, this one's going to be like Godric and Helga off on an adventure, of this course, one's Salazar yeah, yeah, yeah. and Rowena off on an adventure, and, and vice versa, and every every which way. But you know, I think that you get to you get to see each of their relationships, you know, kind of piece together. But it it seems as though the relationship between between Salazar and Godric in particular is so critical to every thing it is you know it has it has reverberations for for a thousand years to come it's like I know. You know, it's, it's like like, <laughs> like we got someone's got to tell the story i know yeah <laughs> and i would love it to be us if you're, you know <laughs> if you're a warner brother <laughs> If you're, if you're, if looking, you're looking for people if you're looking for, well, we could be your idea man we got it anyway guys. love to consult <laughs> Great review, by the way, because it, it led us down a whole other path. So be sure to leave a review if you want to tuck a question in there. We'd be happy to answer that as well. Um, but as ever, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Yeah, we'll see you next time as we dive into Chapter 2, Dobby's Warning Through the Gryffindor.